Muchas gracias al maestro Simón eh, Subin Meta por habernos presentado. A continuación, tengo el gusto de presentarles a Matt Ridley. Él ya ha estado con nosotros en la Ciudad de las Ideas y les voy a leer un poquito sobre su vida para contextualizar la plática que nos va a dar el día de hoy sobre su nuevo libro. Matt Ridley es un periodista y empresario británico mejor conocido por su trabajo sobre el medio ambiente, ciencia y economía. Tiene una licenciatura y un doctorado en filosofía por la Universidad de Oxford. Es autor de libros provocativos sobre la evolución, la genética y la sociedad. Argumenta que la, la capacidad de los seres humanos para conectarse, colaborar y cooperar le da a nuestra especie una capacidad a menudo subestimada para el cambio y el progreso social. Trabajó para The Economist durante nueve años como editor de ciencia y fue corresponsal en Washington y editor en Estados Unidos, antes de convertirse en escritor, conferencista y empresario independiente. Actualmente escribe para la columna Mind and Matter de The Wall Street Journal y escribe regularmente para The Times. En su exitoso libro, The Rational Optimist, eh, Matt Ridley enfrenta el pesimismo contemporáneo para argumentar que a pesar de los desastres y retrocesos, el mundo ha mejorado para la humanidad en los últimos dos siglos y nuestra calidad de vida y riqueza seguirá aumentando por el siglo XXI. Su nuevo libro, The Evolution of Everything, sostiene que los logros más importantes de la humanidad se desarrollan de abajo hacia arriba y contrarresta las suposiciones convencionales de que los principales imperativos científicos y sociales son dictados por las autoridades. Vamos entonces a enlazarnos con Matt Ridley desde Inglaterra. Hello, I am very happy and excited to participate in this international festival of brilliant minds. And I would like to give special thanks to Andres Roma and Ricardo Salinas Pliego for their invitation and for making this event possible. It is an honor to be in Puebla again for this groundbreaking edition of Las Vidas de las Ideas. I want to talk about innovation. My new book is called How Innovation Works. And it begins with the point that we don't really understand how innovation works yet. Uh, it is the most important fact about the modern world. It's the reason why global poverty has declined more in my lifetime than in any previous lifetime. It's the reason why lifespan has expanded dramatically, why we're living longer and longer every year, why we have more and more uh, knowledge about the world, more and more um, devices to help us live our lives. It is the main fact of the last 200 years is innovation and yet it remains to some extent mysterious. Innovation is the reason we will defeat the pandemic of COVID-19. We will have vaccines, we will have cures, we will have other innovative ways of defeating the vaccine. But innovation is also the reason why we have the problem, because if we had more innovation, if we had more innovation in vaccines and diagnostic devices, then we would not be having such a problem with the virus. So it's the fact that we haven't had as much innovation as we could have had that is the reason we're in a problem this year. And that's why innovation is particularly important this year at a time uh, of a global pandemic. So what is innovation? Why does it happen to us? Why does it happen in some industries and not in others? Why does it happen in the first half of the 20th century in transport and in the second half of the 20th century in computing? Why does it change pace? Why does it move around the world and so forth? Innovation is different from invention. This is the first point I want to make. We make uh, stories about inventors, famous people who invent great things, uh, and then the world changes. And it isn't that simple. A lot of innovation doesn't consist of invention. If you think about the container shipping revolution, the, the cause of global trade in the last 50 years, more than anything else, that was a great innovation, but it didn't involve any significant invention of brilliant new technologies. It was just a reorganization uh, of, of the way that uh, uh, containers are put on ships. So uh, innovation isn't the same thing as invention. Uh, and to illustrate the difference, think of a story about a beaver looking at a dam, the Hoover Dam, and saying, no, uh, I didn't build it, but it is based on an idea of mine. Many great innovators are people who 
uh, turn basic ideas, new ideas, into things that are reliable, affordable, and available to everybody. And that's really hard work. And we often leave them out of the story. We say in English, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. It's not true. You have to make the mousetrap reliable. You have to make it affordable. You have to market it. You have to make it available to people. And that is the process of innovation that expands on the basic idea of invention. Great innovators of our day, like Jeff Bezos, are not in inventors. They are innovators. And the other point I want to make about it at the beginning is that we think of innovation as disruptive and sudden and spectacular and revolutionary because the iPhone or the uh, internet comes along and changes our lives, but actually it's gradual. The more you look at in innovation, the more it appears to actually be a gradual process because in the build-up to a new technology disrupting the world, there is a huge amount of incremental change. And once the, the breakthrough has come, there is more incremental change afterwards. Um, think of Moore's law, the law that describes the improvement in computing over 50 years. Um, it, it shows a very gradual progression to more and more efficient computer technologies uh, with no great leaps and jumps, no, 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 no uh, huge changes, just gradual, incremental, inexorable improvement. And that's the story behind nearly all innovations. Sure, there is a moment when the first aeroplane took off into the air, but behind that, there was a long series of experiments on gliders and other things. And after that, there was a long series of experiments to make um, uh, uh, the first aeroplanes into reliable machines that could work. Innovation is also a serendipitous process, and that means it's lucky, it's fortuitous, it's accidental. Things happen in an unpredicted way. There are lots of examples of people who set out to invent one thing and ended up inventing something completely different. Kevlar, Teflon, the post-it note. These are all examples of things invented by people looking for something else. The post-it note was invented at 3M by people looking for permanent glue that would work with paper. And they came up with temporary glue that would work with paper. And they thought that's no good. But then one of them, Art Fry, said, you know, this is just what I need to keep my place in my hymn book at church. So it's actually a good idea, not a bad idea. And that's so often true. Innovators have to change direction halfway through the process. Innovation is an evolutionary process more than it is a revolutionary process. That is to say, it works by descent with modification, that you get one technology and you make it slightly different and then you make it slightly different again, and so on, until you get a new technology. You don't make completely new things. The first motor cars were designed as if they were the offspring of a, of, of a horse carriage and a locomotive with perhaps a little bit of input from a bicycle. Uh, they are combinations of these things that come together uh, in evolutionary ways. And just as evolution... Uh, shows um, uh, works by recombination with different genes combining in different ways to make new combinations in different organisms. So the same is true of innovation. Most innovation consists of taking existing technologies, existing substances, and combining them in new ways. Uh, my favorite example of this is the pill camera, which came about after a conversation over a garden fence between a gastroenterologist and a guided missile designer. So evolution is uh, innovation is an evolutionary and recombinant phenomenon. It's also a team sport, a collaborative exercise. We like to tell stories about solitary, brilliant minds who did in inventive things, sitting on their own, thinking, like Archimedes in his bath, or, uh, uh, or, Tom, or James Watt looking at the uh, kettle on the stove, seeing its, its lid bounce around. But actually, these stories are always invented after the, after the effect. In fact, when you examine how innovations happen, they happen because people are talking to each other. They're collaborating, they're cooperating, they're thinking with each other. In 1903, there were two attempts to build the first aeroplane, the first powered plane. One was by Samuel Langley in Washington. It was a total failure. 
Langley was a brilliant man who had gone off in, a, in his own uh, private secret way and designed the aeroplane from scratch with a lot of money from the government. Um, whereas uh, a few weeks later, uh, on an island off North Carolina, Orville and Wilbur Wright succeeded where Langley had failed because they had built gliders and tried them out and they had talked to other people and they had collaborated with people all over the world and they had drawn upon ideas of people who'd built other gliders and other machines. They had incorporated ideas, particularly from a brilliant Australian called Lawrence Hargrave. They knew that the way to get the first aeroplane in the air was to collaborate and cooperate with other people, to combine ideas. And they also knew that it was important to do lots of experiments, that innovation is a process of trial and error. And this is something that great innovators always emphasize, that they didn't know what the answer was, that they had to try and fail, fail often, fail fast, and try again. Thomas Edison famously said that I haven't failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. When he was building his light bulb, he set out to make it reliable, to make it such that it wouldn't go pop after one hour or two hours. And the way he did that was by trying 6,000 different kinds of plant until he could find a fiber that made a filament that lasted for a long time. That's the kind of effort you have to put in, in trial and error, to achieve a, a light bulb uh, or something like that. Now, when Thomas Edison built a reliable light bulb, he wasn't the only person doing it. Um, he was the first person to make it reliable, but 20 other people in different parts of the world had separately, independently invented light bulbs by that time. That's pretty extraordinary. That's a weird coincidence. Why would 21 people invent light bulbs around the same time? Well, the answer is the idea was ripe. It was ready to go. Electricity had reached the point where it was inevitable that people would, would work out that vacuum uh, bulbs with electric filaments in them would, good give, would give good light. If you think about the search engine in the 1990s, it's a similar story. Lots of different people invented search engines around the same time, not just Google, but many other firms and many other individuals. And uh, the reason was because once you'd invented the internet, it was sort of inevitable that people would want to search for the things they wanted to find on it and that search engines would become the universal um, machine of the internet, the, the best way of making money out of the internet. It's obvious, isn't it? Well, it wasn't obvious at the time. It's obvious in retrospect that that was going to happen, but nobody saw it coming. Everybody uh, who was studying how the internet would work in the 1980s, almost to a man, they failed to predict the development of search engines, let alone that that would be the way to make money out of the internet. So there is something inexorable and inevitable about innovation once it gets going, but also something very unpredictable. And that's a rather puzzling asymmetry that I haven't quite understood myself. A good example of what can happen um, with this uh, is that people uh, underestimate the impact of a technology in the long run, but they overestimate it in the short run. In 1998, the Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman said of the internet that by 2005, it will have become clear that the Internet's impact on the economy is no greater than the fax machines. That turned out to be a very bad prediction. But at the time, it looked quite like quite a good prediction because actually e-commerce was not developing as fast as many of the hype merchants had predicted. Um, uh, what happens with a new technology is that in the first 15 years, it's often quite disappointing. It doesn't fulfill it, its promise. And then it suddenly gathers pace and takes off. And I call this Amara's hype cycle after Roy Amara, who was the first person to say uh, that we underestimate the impact of new technologies in the long run, but we overestimate them in the short run. It's not a linear phenomenon. It's an S-shaped curve. Now, where does innovation happen? And what are the conditions under which innovation happens? Well, there's one overwhelming phenomenon, and that innovation likes freedom. It likes places where people are free to experiment, free to do trial and error, free to fail, free to invest, uh, free to collaborate, free to trade, free to exchange. And also where customers and consumers are free to purchase what they want, free to express their wishes through the market. So 
you, you, you tend to find that innovation happens in places, in free, free cities, free trading city-states, like Renaissance Italy or ancient Greece um, or Victorian Britain. These are the places where innovation has flourished. And in fact, when you look at it, fragmented governance is quite a good idea. Big, uniform uh, empires are not very good at innovation. The Roman Empire was not very innovative. The Ottoman Empire was not very innovative. In fact, quite the reverse. It, it, it kept printing out for hundreds of years. Uh, the Ming Empire in China uh, stifled innovation very effectively for several centuries. Whereas fragmented Europe with lots of different countries for four or 500 years was by far the most innovative place on the, on the planet. And why? Because inventors could move. They could get up and move and leave one small city state and go to another if they didn't like the regime. And the same was true in America in, in, the, in the 20th century. It was the, the fact that it was a federal system with lots of different states was absolutely vital. You even see that happening today. Elon Musk is threatening to leave California because he doesn't like the tax regime and move to Texas, and a lot of other people are doing the same. So fragmented governance does help innovation. Um, uh, and the same is true in companies. Big companies tend not to be innovative. Small companies are better at innovation. The relationship between science and innovation uh, is an unusual one. It is not straightforward. It is not a case of science leading to applications every time. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes it happens the other way around. Technology leads to science, that actually you get um, uh, disc inventions in, in industry that then lead to discoveries in science. Uh, the, 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 the steam engine led to the science of thermodynamics rather than the other way around. The, the discovery of CRISPR gene editing, for which the Nobel Prize was won just a few weeks ago, is a good example of this. It was a discovery made in universities, but building on work that had been done in industry, in the yogurt industry, trying to understand the bacterial defenses against viruses. This is quite a common phenomenon. Science, uh, sorry, innovation does not lead to the destruction of jobs. For 200 years, we are worried about automation and innovation leading to the destruction of jobs. It doesn't happen. It never happens. It never will. In the 1960s, we worried that computers in factories would lead to mass unemployment. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen with artificial intelligence today. Um, uh, because we create new professions, new jobs out of innovation. Try explaining to someone from the 1900s what a uh, flight attendant is, or a software engineer. Nor is it true that innovation can, will run out, that, re, that innovation is finite, that we're going to re reach diminishing returns, which eco economists assumed for a very long time, that innovation was a temporary phenomenon that would run out of steam. Why not? Because we can always do more with less. Innovation can consist of using fewer resources. We use 13% as much aluminium in a drinks can as we did 20 years ago. We use... Um, we can... We use 68% less land to grow a given amount of food today as we did 50 years ago. We use less steel in cars, less aluminium, less uh, glass in building and so on. Uh, we, can, we can do more with less. And as I say, one of the key features of innovation is that it flourishes in freedom. Now take the case of China. China was the most innovative part of the world in the Song Dynasty a thousand years ago. It invented uh, uh, printing and gunpowder and the compass and all these different technologies. Why? Because it was a not very centralized empire at the time. It was a dynasty with, in which there was a lot of local decision making in which merchants were free to do things. Then the Ming Empire came along and innovation ceased. Something similar has happened in recent decades. After the fall of Mao, under Deng Xiaoping, China became very free economically while being very unfree politically. If you wanted to start a new political party, it was impossible. But if you wanted to start a new company, that was easy. That is now changing under Xi, Xi Jinping. And I think the great period of Chinese innovation is going to come to an end as a result. So what we need to remember for the, for the future of innovation is that innovation is the parent of prosperity, but it is the child of freedom. And that, for me, is the great lesson of innovation, that if we give it freedom, it will deliver extraordinary prosperity for us to escape this pandemic and to have a bright future for mankind in the future. Thank you and have a great meeting in Puebla. I'm sorry I can't be there this year.